Listen for the voice of the Beloved One, whispering soft words of comfort, shouting in defiance of silences that suppress, singing songs of justice, declaring truths that transform from within. The Holy has not abandoned us. Divine wisdom surrounds us. God will bless the fruit of the faithful and bring hope to all who yearn for freedom. Let, Let every weary and tattered heart be encouraged, and the joy of the despairing be renewed. Let us pray together. God of infinite mercy and love, we come before you this day, knowing that we have not always been faithful to what you would have us do. We have too often turned our backs on those in need, choosing not to hear their cries. Forgive us and guide us on the path of compassion and peace as we continue to pray. In the name of Christ, who leads us into life, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have you ever heard the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Well, part of that's true. Sticks and stones will definitely break bones, so don't hit people with sticks, and please don't throw stones at people. It's not nice. It's not okay. But words do hurt, and they can hurt. See, when people say mean things to each other, it hurts their feelings. Sometimes people say mean things to themselves, like, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not smart enough. And that's not okay. We're always to treat others the way we want to be treated. We should treat ourselves well too. We should say kind and loving things to ourselves and to others. So this week, I want you to show God's love by saying something nice to someone else as many times as you can. Whether it's a thank you, or a, I like your shoes, or your haircut's pretty cool. Our words can hurt, but 
our words can also be filled with God's love. And that's what we need from you this week, my favorite superheroes. To shine God's love by saying something kind to someone else. Let's pray. Hey God, thank you so much for teaching us how to be kind and how to use our words so that they don't hurt. Help us show your love in everything we do. We love you. Amen. Bye, friends. Hello, church family. Welcome to the Youth Minute. He's Vincent. And this is Sophie. And we are coming live from Dolphin Island. All right. Here we have the always infamous Alan Butler. Yes. Alan, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Alan. I'm the youth minister at St. John's. I just graduated from seminary. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas originally. I've got three sisters, um, one of which is a twin. Um, I love sports and uh, I've got a dog. His name is George. I think that's all we need to know for now. All right, Alan. Vincent? Want to proceed with the lightning round? The lightning round, yes. Are you familiar with the rules of the lightning round, Alan? I am familiar with the rules of the lightning round. All right, All right so we're gonna ask Just questions. Just a refresher. We're gonna ask a couple of questions. And you answer them as quick as you can. Are you ready? I guess so. All right, Alan. Okay, three, two, one. What is your favorite color? Uh, blue. What is your favorite smell? Mm, um, it's lightning around Alan, quick, come on. Rain. Rain. All right, what's your favorite sound? Uh, a, good, a good snap. All right, uh, what's your favorite state? Uh, Texas. Oh, your favorite snack? Snack? Um, I really love Gardettos. Favorite fiction book? They were a fiction book. Um, ooh, uh, The Fourth Bear. Okay. Uh, who's your favorite youth? Uh, oh, are we out of like, time? Out of time. <laughs> All right, Alan. We're going to proceed with some long questions so you can take as much as you want. Um, we're going to start with who shall we start with, Vincent? Start with Bradley. All right, Bradley, ask your first question. Um, what was your best memory from college? Um, ooh. So I had a lot of fun in college. I think as far as like really exciting times go, um, the Butler versus Gonzaga game that ended up being like on ESPN College Game Day one Saturday, um, and Butler stole an in inbound pass and uh, one on a buzzer, uh, and that was very exciting for me. Sounds great, sounds fun. I heard we have another question from Bradley. Oh uh, yeah. What is your favorite fast food place in the suburb you call Fort Worth? Um, nobody calls it a suburb except for y'all. There are close to 900,000 people living in Fort Worth. Um, but I would have to say Whataburger uh, all the way. I've heard rumors that Whataburger is coming to Memphis. I've seen the rumors. I don't, I don't buy them just yet. Mm. All right. Uh, next question we have from Chris. If there's any place in the world that you want to go to, where will it be? Ooh. Um... I think I would really like to go to Machu Picchu and like hike in, uh, in Peru or go to um, maybe Ireland. Okay. And Chris, do you have another question or? I have another one. What is your favorite amusement park? A favorite amusement park. Um, so we had uh, Six Flags Over Texas in Texas. Uh, so I would probably just go with that since that's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, yeah, that's a final answer. All right. And last but not least, we'll go to Audrey. Audrey, your first question is... Okay, uh, what's your favorite movie? 
My favorite movie uh, is probably Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Mm, that's a popular movie. Audrey, do you have another question for Alan? Yes. Um, what is your favorite thing about being a youth leader? I would have to say kind of watching y'all grow as we go on. Um, obviously, there were great traits in each of you when I started, uh, but just kind of seeing you grow and develop into young adults uh, has been really exciting and kind of rewarding. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's got to be the kids, right? I like hanging out with y'all most of the time. We like hanging out with you. Oh, thanks. Well, not to get too emotional, but we got to wrap this up. Vincent, want to wrap it up? Would you like to close in a prayer on? I would be delighted to. Holy God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to come together. We're grateful for the technology that allows us to do this. God, I ask that you would be with each and every one of these youth, that you would strengthen them and hold them. <laughs> God, I ask that your presence would be felt in each of their lives and in the lives of this church. God, we ask that you would be with those who are fighting against racism and diseases. We seek all of this in your holy name. Amen. 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 Good prayer, Alan. Great prayer. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you very soon. Yeah. Peace. 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 Good morning, everyone. This little guinea pig, his name is Creamer, is on his way to a forever home. He's just spending the week with Rob and me. So, we're coming to you this morning from the home office where it's not so humid. Hope you're all staying well and staying connected. If you need help getting connected or getting used to Zoom, <clears throat> Just send me an email. My email is mwhite at stjohnsmidtown.org. Let us pray. God, we thank you for another day. We thank you even in the midst of our struggles, even in the midst of a pandemic and our struggle to correct social injustices. We thank you for your constant presence with us. Help us, God to do our best and to forgive ourselves and others when we fall short. Help us to see clearly where we need to take action, where we need to change ourselves and help others as you would. Please help us to stay focused on what is beautiful and inspiring, no matter how small or insignificant it may seem. Help us to see the good around us and to take nothing for granted. Teach us to treasure each other and each day that you give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stay safe, everyone. See you soon. The scripture reading for this morning is Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Good morning, St. John's. Will you pray with me? Now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of the hearts of all of us in this place be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. As we heard read this morning, Jesus comes across a Canaanite woman in his travels. Now friends, it is difficult to overstate the drama in this story. Because as far as the Jews were concerned, 
Canaanites weren't really to be counted as human beings. They were longtime enemies of Israel, those evil pagans who occupied the promised land. They worshipped many gods, fertility cults, human sacrifice, and ritual prostitution. They didn't go to the synagogue, and they didn't practice kosher. If anyone was of the wrong religion, she was. If anyone wasn't saved, she wasn't. And if anyone was going to hell, she most certainly was. So for this woman to even approach Jesus, she has to break any number of cultural taboos. Yelling at Jesus to heal her demon-possessed daughter. She's a Gentile approaching a Jew. A woman approaching a group of men. A half-breed approaching the purebreds. From their personal perspective, this Canaanite woman is definitely an abomination. And surprisingly, it sounds like Jesus is buying into this worldview defined by negative stereotypes and long-held prejudices. Rather than responding to her with his usual compassion, Jesus speaks not a word to her at all. Here she is a desperate mother of a very sick child. And she's mustered up the courage to put herself at the mercy of this distinguished rabbi, and he just ignores her. His silence is deafening. The text says, but Jesus did not answer her at all. The disciples, who feel it is their job to protect him from these crazies, suddenly start acting like overzealous bouncers. From his silence, they sense that he is dismissing her out of hand. So ramping up their enthusiasm, they call out, send her away, anything to stop her shouting. Actually, the scholars tell us that the Greek word is krazo, meaning shrieking or screeching, the implication being that the sounds were not pleasant to hear, like fingernails on a chalkboard or like an ear-splitting fire alarm, the kind of shrill, high-pitched noise that makes you want to put your fingers in your ears. And so the disciples demand that Jesus get rid of her, anything to stop that awful screeching. Look, lady, says Jesus. Actually, what he calls her is not so polite, but it's a word that's not fit for worship. Look, lady, says Jesus, get your own Messiah. I haven't come for people like you. I've got my hands full with the lost sheep of Israel without getting involved with your kind. And the disciples are probably giving him a thumbs up Good call, Jesus. Not only do you not want to associate with her, you don't even want to get close to her. Buzz off, lady. I cannot allow myself to be distracted. I have a whole nation to save. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And, I imagine he says, something like, I'm not going to waste my energy on some Gentile woman while my own people go wanting. It's a boundary issue, and that is supposed to be that. But the woman won't give up. She demands to be heard. Yes, Jesus has ignored her, but she will not be ignored. Jesus has dissed her, but she will not be dissed. And now she's on her knees begging, Lord, help me. And just see Jesus' veins bulging in his neck. What part of no does she not understand? Who does she think she is? Jesus has told her that she is not his sheep. So with teeth clenched, he says it louder and clearer than before. It's not fair to take the children's food 
and throw it to the dogs. Wait, surely those words did not just come out of the mouth of Jesus. Because that was about the worst thing that somebody in the first century could call somebody else a Gentile dog. This is not one of Jesus' finest moments. Throughout the gospel, he responds immediately to anyone who cries out to him for mercy or for healing. Let the children come unto me, he says. Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree, he says. Bring blind Bartimaeus here, he says. So what's going on? Where is sweet Jesus, meek and mild? This exchange is uncharacteristically cold and callous. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, Since Jesus was a human being as well as the Son of God, it seems fair to guess what was or perhaps might have been going on with him. He was discouraged and weary and a long way from home. And every time he turned around, somebody wanted something from him. But at the same time, no one wanted what he wanted to give most, namely himself, in terms of who he was for them, and not only in terms of what he could do for them. It was frustrating to be thought of as only an equal opportunity miracle worker. Again, quoting Taylor, it's not hard to imagine how that feels, even if you do not happen to be the Messiah. The telephone rings, and it's the Association for Retarded Citizens hoping that you have clothes to donate. Or the firefighters asking you to buy tickets for needy children to go to the circus. Or the Kidney Foundation seeking donations. The doorbell chimes, and a weather-beaten old man in overalls asks for work, while his entire family is waiting and watching from their ancient station wagon parked in your driveway. The mail carrier delivers more pleas for help from every cause under the sun. The Red Cross, Second Harvest, Cystic Fibrosis, Native American Rights, Civil Liberties, Abused Children, the Environment. As it was for Jesus, it is for us, it has gotten out of hand. And we do have to draw the line somewhere. I mean, should we knock on doors for our favorite candidate or just send money to the campaign? Do we lobby against abortion or work to reduce the number of abortions in Tennessee? Do we make a donation for cancer research or do we offer our friend a ride to her chemo treatments? I mean, we can't do it all. We have to decide whom we can help and whom we cannot help. We have to decide what we can do and what we cannot do. We have to draw a line somewhere because everything we have, everything we have, it's not enough to feed the hunger of the world. And so we do. Like Jesus, we place limits on ourselves to protect ourselves. And like Jesus, we may get angry when one more of the needy multitude wants more from us. I know it's your day off, but could you just give me one more chance? I'm sorry to bother you at home, but can you spare a dollar? And we invoke the line and restate the boundary. It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, we say, or words to that effect. And it sounds harsh, but what are we going to do? There's only so much of us to go around. And we have learned by Jesus' example, you have to draw the line somewhere. Even so, this Canaanite woman simply will not let it be. Instead, she challenges Jesus on his own terms by her living brazen faith to cross a boundary that threatens to undo him. Dog I may be, she says, but even the dogs are allowed to gather up the crumbs under the master's table. And that is all I'm asking. It is
is a shocking retort that must have left Jesus astonished. For in a very real sense, she turns his metaphor back on him. Instead of disputing her status as second in line behind the mission to Israel, she humbly acknowledges her position as an outsider. And without denying the Jews the prime seats at the table, she makes her point that there remains a place for her as well. Combining tenacity with humility and grit with grace, the Canaanite woman refuses Jesus' characterization of the Gentile others as dogs, turning the insult into an opportunity. Even on her knees, she stands up to Jesus and stakes her claim on the mercy and generosity of God. We can almost see the gleam in her eye as she out-rabbis the rabbi herself. She's the only person that I know of in the Bible who wins a debate with Jesus. It was her theology, her chutzpah, her faith, that brought forth Jesus' realization that his mission was to be to the wider Gentile world. That Canaanite woman was Sojourner Truth and Rosa Parks and Celeste Ray and Martha Bowers all rolled into one. Yes, Lord, she says when he calls her a dog. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Not surprisingly, writes Reverend Wayne Hilliker, Bible experts have been so perplexed, as we perhaps are, by the harshness of Jesus' reply that actually they've tried to tone it down or to explain it away. I mean, some commentaries have even gone to great pains to show that the word that Jesus used for dog meant puppy and that his use of the word was with a smile And therefore, his response really didn't denigrate the woman. Well, whether it means puppy or not, if it has four legs and a tail and it barks, it's a dog. And Matthew reports that that is what Jesus called this woman and her daughter. There are others who would argue that Jesus was just waiting for her to prove her faith, that Jesus is just testing her and the disciples all along. And I guess they could be right about that. But on this particular occasion, it is as though Jesus is the one who is experiencing the conversion, the mind changing, the heart turning, when we expect it to be the other way around. Woman, says Jesus, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter is healed instantly. And it is, as one preacher writes, being a faithful people is all about changing the rules and being changed ourselves. It's about crossing boundaries and breaking down barriers. Suddenly, the character of God made flesh in Jesus does not only have to do with chosen people, not only with purebreds, with Shelties and Great Danes and German short-haired pointers, but also with mongrels, mutts, half-breeds, and Heinz 57s. The ones that track mud into our sanctuaries and shake pond water all over our doctrine, who hungrily snarf up any little morsel that falls and don't know how to sit or stay properly. The secret we must all discover from outcasts like the Canaanite woman is that if we hold up their name in the mirror, we come face to face with the holy name. And those we would write off as dogs become revealers of God. Those recovering from addiction those coming out of prison, those crossing borders, and all those we tend to label as outsiders, as them, not us. Rich old curmudgeons who refuse to contribute to the church budget. Spiritual, but not religious, who are confounded by the institution. 
and the so-called nuns who have never even darkened the door of the church. Yeah, young kids with attitudes, evangelical do-gooders, left-wing liberals, drug dealers, white trash, welfare queens, or dogs. Regardless of our prejudices, divine love is not restricted by the lines that we draw or the boundaries we devise or the limits that we set. No, even the dogs get the master's crumbs. And the put down, the shut out, the dispensable, the ones nobody cares about, nobody sees, everybody uses, everybody discounts, they are God's precious children. Queers and retards and illegals and bums, no matter what we call them, God calls them beloved. Demean them, deport them, imprison them, dehumanize them, and God will fight for them like a mother for her baby girl. It's true, St. John's. God cuts through all our meanness and raises up the ones that we would put down. That is just what God does. The best lesson, I suppose, is that the church is expected to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and be converted by the faith of the outcast and the ignored, the rejected and the insulted. And that's the reason why we have just got to go on working for affordable housing for our impoverished neighbors, seeking health assistance for the unsheltered mental health assistance fighting for quality education for all children, refusing to remain silent in the face of bigotry and intolerance, hearing the cries of the desperate and depressed, demanding the end of the murder of young men because of the color of their skin, faithfully addressing in our own way, loudly or quietly, any issue of exclusion which still plagues the church this neighborhood, our city, or the world. Not because we have to, not because we ought to, and not even because we want to, because it's God's own self waiting for us on the other side. That's why we do it. When you've done it under the least of these, you've done it under me. Yes, through the fierce conviction of the Canaanite woman comes healing for the child and hope for the world. Jesus learns that God's purpose for him is bigger than he imagined and that there is enough of him to go around and that unbiased grace is at work on both sides of the fence. So here's the question I will leave with you to ponder this week. If the Canaanite woman could bring about a change in Jesus, could expand his understanding of his mission and his ministry. What does that say about us if she does not convert us to? In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. And now we have heard the word read and the word proclaimed, and we have an opportunity, a privilege, really, to respond. And one way to do that is with our financial gifts, because we remember that in community, the well-being of all life is interconnected, and we turn then from individualism and self-sufficiency, and we practice solidarity with one another, both in joy and with the struggle by sharing what we have and giving and receiving in mutual love, we honor God's intentions for life and we create openings for the flourishing that both God and we desire. So in faith, let's make our offerings together, online, if we've not already done so.
and now receive this benediction. Go out into the world and love God and serve your neighbor in all that you do, so that those for whom grace and grit are a stranger will find in you generous friends. Go in peace. Amen.